Pastor Garrett. I'm getting more and more used to saying this, even though God knew that he was there, that was going to be his calling. Uh, he's going to come up and share with us. And as he's coming up right now, I just want to, you guys, uh, be praying for him under your breath right now. He had a weekend where he spent uh, building a loft house in Mexico with some some uh, other people from the church. He's already preached twice this morning, you know. Uh, so I'm just uh, hold up, just a few more more minutes, brother. Hold up. So would you welcome him as he comes up. All right. Well, I miss you guys. Today, Kathy, I love seeing you guys. I miss everyone here. It's you know, it's, time goes by super quick. I was looking at the calendar. I was like, wow, we're almost getting into June now, right? And so being here with each one of you, seeing you guys, just brings it recharges me. Even if I'm a little fatigued, just being here with you guys charges me up. Uh, Pastor, are you good? Oh, good. Yeah, me. Yeah. Go for yeah. it. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Francisco. Perfect. So guys, I'm going to do something a little bit different than what we have here um, in the notes. I want to read those lyrics again. That was ex extremely impactful. The second, it's the second um, group of lyrics there. It reads, to know and follow hard after you. Yes. To grow as your disciple in the truth. The world is empty, pale, and poor. Compared to knowing you, my Lord, lead me on, and I will run after you. Lead me on, and I will run after you. That, Amen. I don't know, but as that was being sung, that just hit me like a freight train. So I want to thank you guys for just sharing, and, and the worship today was beautiful. Before we dive in, I'm going to ask that we bow our heads and we'll lift up a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the fruit uh, that's being born from this church. I thank you for the hands and feet, Lord Jesus, every week that come and they volunteer their time, their talents, their efforts. Jesus, to be disciples for you and to lead people to you, Jesus. I thank you for every person here, Lord, uh, part of Hope City Church. This is your church, Lord, and I thank you for everyone here. I thank you for their hearts. I ask and pray that we would be impacted greatly by the reading, by the studying of your word. It's alive, it's breathing, Jesus, and I thank you for this time that you've ordained for us to open your word and study. We love you, Jesus. Be this time in your mighty, precious name. Amen. Amen. So today is, uh, it's going to be a fun day, I promise, guys. The, the, the whole message today really is focused around this portion of Scripture in Ephesians. I think you guys will have your handouts there. Jim, thanks for preparing those. Everyone should have those. Uh, if, you do, if you need one, let me know, and then we can get one. Mr. West, would you mind getting me one? Oh, here we go. Perfect. Great. Thank you, Jim. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8, and then we're going to be trekking up to verse 17. But the title of today's message is our, our position and our practice. So Paul is, in a, is writing out of the church of Ephesus. He's writing a letter, a beautiful letter. And the, the significance of the letter is when it's broken down, the first half of the letter, he's reminding the church of our position, our position. Our position, which is in Christ. As born-again Christians, we are, in fact, in Christ. But the last half of the letter, and we're going to be in this right now, what he's doing is he's reminding us not only of our position, but he's reminding us of our practice. That means how we're to walk as followers of Jesus. What we're to be doing, how our practice should look. And then he gets even more specific, and he shows what it means when our position and our practice are in alignment with one another. Church, it's important for us to remember that he's writing to a church in Ephesus where there's a lot of big things happening. The church is surrounded by sexual immorality to levels that are just um, incredible. He's writing to this church that he pastored. He was there between his second and third missionary journey, equipping them, sharing the message of the gospel, and Paul utilizing every platform that God would ordain for him to use from the synagogue, where he would preach the message of the gospel to the Jews. And then he would preach the message of the gospel in a university hall, 
He'd use whatever God had given him, and I think it's such a good reminder for us today. Let's use whatever platform God's given us. If it's Sunday at Hope City, if it's uh, preparing the meal, whatever it may be, and we see how important it is to remember the platforms that God's given us, that we leverage those for the kingdom of heaven. Acts 19, a little bit of history, tells us that many came to faith in Jesus. Many, many people came to faith in Jesus. But Paul, it wasn't just butterflies and daisies and, and easygoing. Paul was met with heavy, heavy opposition. There were riots that would break out because Paul actually was taking business away from the silversmiths that were making these little fertility goddesses to a pagan goddess named Diana. Mm. They didn't like that. He was running business out of, out of the revenue out of their pockets. So one of the things that um, is important to think about is that Paul, we think about the decline of a place like Ephesus. Paul had been there. He had been boots on the ground in Ephesus. He knew that the culture was extremely pagan in nature. And so now Paul is writing from, from Rome as a prisoner, and he's going to share with them what is important to hold fast to mm -hmm. as we're to walk, even in the midst of challenging days, as children of God. So if you have your Bible, I'm going to ask that we open these up. Or you guys have your sheets, I'm sorry. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8. I'm going to open up. I'm going to read this out loud, and then we're going to start diving in and unpacking this portion of Scripture. We'll be going verse by verse as we study through this today. But let me start it up. This is verse 8, chapter 5. And it reads, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Yes. Let's go back to now to Ephesians chapter 5, 8 to 10. Just one more time. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Think about this today. Before we entered into a position with uh, a relationship with Jesus Christ, Paul makes it very clear. God word makes, God's word makes it very clear that you and I were not just in darkness. Paul gets even more specific. He says, you and I, we were darkness. Mm -hmm. We were the darkness. That's a heavy yeah. statement. Yeah. But he goes even deeper than that. Earlier in the book of Ephesians, Mike and our men on Wednesday nights, we've been studying through this, and it's woven in perfectly as he says that we were among those who conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath. Another heavy statement. But so true. So, church, think about this today. Christ follower, think about this today. We lived in darkness. We were darkness. But at the moment that you placed your faith in Jesus, at the moment that you repented of your sin, at the moment that you gave your heart to Jesus Christ, yeah. there was a shift in your position. Yeah. Significant. The biggest thing that yeah. will ever happen to you. Amen. There was a shift in your position. Your, your position changed from a position of darkness to a position of righteousness. Yes. Paul uses this term over and over throughout his letters, this term being justified. Justified, justified means that we are declared righteous by Amen. God, not because of anything special that we've done, not because of how well we perform, yeah. not because of how much we give. But just being justified means that we're declared righteous by God and in the eyes of a holy God. Romans 5 verse 1 says it really well too. Romans 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Paul's saying this, that before you and I entered into a relationship with Jesus, we were at enmity. This means that we were in direct conflict, direct opposition 
We were rebels against a holy God. But something happened. The position changed from light to darkness. So how are we to walk now? What are these key identifiers that Paul uses? Paul says that goodness, righteousness, and truth are these key indicators of what it looks like for the believer. And how is this achieved? Is this only achieved through the work of the Holy Spirit? At the moment in time that we became justified, what happens in salvation, or through salvation, in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit takes up residence within us. There's an activity that takes place, and the byproduct of that activity is the fruit of the Spirit coming out in our lives, to people in our neighborhoods, people around us. Goodness defined in the original Greek text is identified as uprightness of heart and uprightness of one's life. David would talk about righteousness and how righteousness is defined in Psalm 1. And it's beautiful because he says this, righteousness is defined as one who delights in the Lord. Thirdly, the truth is defined in the Greek as to unhide. These qualities, church, are not only pleasing to God, these are to be markers within our life and markers that we can live out on a consistent basis. I will fall short. We will fall short. But God knows the heart. And God sees our frailty. He sees our weakness. And that's why we can always go back and ask for forgiveness when we don't make it. Make the cut. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11. Let's continue on. We have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Earlier we touched a little bit on what the culture looked like in Ephesus. This is important because this shows you the depravity of the culture at that time. They erected a massive temple, huge temple, in the city of Ephesus, centrally located. And what they would do is thousands of people would worship at a time, and they would worship the pagan fertility goddess named Diana, or Artemis. Evil, wicked, practice of pagan worship. The question to think about today is think about the condition of the culture in Ephesus then. Think about what the church in Ephesus was surrounded by then. Think about the current condition of the culture in America today. And think about what the church in America, even the church corporately, is surrounded by today. We've seen, I think it's safe to say, that we've seen a rapid moral decline just as when Paul was on the ground there, now he's writing a letter. Think about how much progression took place just within that time frame. But you and I as Christ's followers are to have no fellowship with non-productive, unfruit-bearing activity. Non-fruit-bearing activity. We're to have no fellowship with them. These are identified in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, Contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries. These are the unfruitful works of darkness. Church, think about this. Darkness produces unfruitful works. God's spirit, the light, produces fruit of the spirit. And Paul doesn't stop there. He goes even deeper. He's building upon what, what he's writing here. He's saying, we are to be, we're not to be passive or to conform towards the works of darkness. Paul was even deeper. He says, we're literally called to take action against the works of darkness through exposing it, through uncovering these works. So this is where the story begins. On Monday, April 18th, I got a text message from a friend at work. And the text message was speaking about a, a, a bill, a specific legislative bill that's moving its way through the chains right now. But there is a lobby day for this bill. It's called bill, Assembly Bill AB 2223. And this is a heavy bill. This is a very heavy bill. This bill was offered by a, um, a woman named Buffy Wicks. I use the name um, because it's, we're gonna come back to this later in the story. But really, the bill is a direct attack on the sanctity of life for the child in the womb, and also the baby that's been born up to 28 days after birth. This is in the legislation, guys. This is what's being authored. So what happens is I read the bill, and I think that I misread it, and so I read the bill, and I begin to weep. This is a reality. This is what we're looking at. How do we get here? What, what, how do we get to this? And the Holy Spirit put on my heart and reminded me, son, 
I want you to go to the Capitol. April 18th, I took a half day off work. I called my, my neighbor, Dominic, and I said, Dom, if we can get in the car, we can get there with one tank of gas. And if we leave by 12 p.m., we'll get there by 8. We thought we had it all calculated until we had to go through Pasadena traffic. Oh, yeah. And that was a hot mess. So we ended up getting there at 9.30 p.m. And we had no idea what we were going to walk into, guys. The next morning, we meet in the lobby downstairs. There's 3,000 people that show up all from churches in California. Calvary Chapel Chino, Sanctuary was represented. Calvary Chapel Orange County, churches in Sacramento, babies, old folk, everyone in between, every color, every creed, every nationality, every ethnicity. It was a beautiful thing. The body of Christ showed up to stand for righteousness. And there was, we were there for one reason, to show, to be a presence for righteousness and to do what God called us to do. This is the anthem, listen to this. This was the anthem for the entire lobby dates. Proverbs, out of Proverbs 31, verse eight and nine. This is heavy. Open your mouth for the speechless and the cause of all who are appointed to die. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and the needy. So we hear that. They're talking about the bill. They're talking about the details of the bill. We're getting ready to go to the Capitol where we can lobby against our representatives so they understand the contents of the bill. All of a sudden, the woman comes up and says, you know what, guys? You can't go to the Capitol. We can't go inside the Capitol. There's been an unruly group, and uh, they closed the doors uh, to the offices. But she says, well, we can go do one thing. We can go pray. And so 3,000 people walk over to the Capitol. And there's a few pastors and they're sharing information about our position as the church towards the, the, uh, this, how sacred life is. And there was prayer time, it was beautiful. And this song broke out among, imagine this, thousands of people, Christians, our brothers and sisters. This song broke out. Jesus loves the little children. Mm -hmm. All the children of the world. Yep. Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Yeah. We sing that song to our daughter every night yeah. as we're getting her ready for bed. And she sings it out loud. And she loves that part. Red, yellow, black, and white. They're precious in his sight. And she's fist pumping and she gets so excited. And as the song's going on, I see a woman walking right next to me wearing a bright pink blazer. She's got a security team with her. It's Buffy Wicks the author of the bill. I look at Buffy and I can see her. She's pale. You can tell that she's convicted. There's an inner turmoil. God's word says in Romans chapter two that the work of the law is written on the heart of the Gentile. Right. Believe it or not, if you're not a Christ father, you still know what's right and what's wrong. True. God's given us a conscience. So what happens is the Holy Spirit refrained me from saying something that I, my flesh was saying, say something, say something, let her know where you stand. And the Holy Spirit refrained me and said, son, pray for her. Pray for her. So I'll continue the story as we move through the message today. But let's look now at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 12. We'll continue moving through the story as it's woven into our scripture today. Five, uh, chapter 5, verse 12 reads, For it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Paul here, referencing sin that's committed in a secret place, a dark place. Think about the story today. Sin took place as a bill was authored. And it came from the heart, and it was authored on this legislation. And this is where it started, but it didn't, it didn't stay there. The bill now moving its way through all the different levels of legislation. And if that bill becomes, uh, if that bill passes, its impact is enormous, yeah. in, impacting millions of lives. But this is how sin works. It starts off as something small, something private, something that happens in the dark. No one can see. But guys, I have, we have some news. And I think we can all say that it's evident through the reading of God's word that God is omniscient. That means he's all-knowing. He sees it all. He knows the heart. Proverbs 21 verse 2 reads, Every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. The Lord knows the valleys of Garrett's heart. He knows the dark places of Garrett's heart. He knows the heart of every single person in this room. And so what happens is this doesn't, sin doesn't just stay 
it continues to move, and this is what we're going to be talking about here shortly. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 13 will continue on. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. Manifest is a fancy word for it makes something apparent. They're exposed or made apparent by the light, for whatever makes manifest or apparent is light. Think about this, church. Light exposes sin. It makes it apparent. Think about the power of the message of the gospel here for a moment. The gospel exposes darkness in that it brings to light the reason for why Jesus Christ came. And this is what's so heavy. It's important for us as Christians today to think about what it was. It was sin. It was a sin issue. When we share the message of the gospel to people, friends, family, and Hope City, I think it's important for us to always be considerate and be reminded that that message may not be met in a welcoming manner because there's a sin issue in that. Have you guys ever shared your faith with someone? Yeah. And maybe someone becomes offended. Someone gets upset with you. There's an underlying reason for that. The issue is sin. It exposes exactly what Paul's talking about. Sin is being exposed. And now what happens is sin being the big issue, requires a big solution. In God sends his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to be able to bridge this gap. And it requires a response to repent and to believe upon the name of Jesus or not. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14 will continue. Verse 16 reads, Therefore he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you work circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Think about this sequence that Paul's using. It's really important that we look at this. He's saying, awake, arise, and receive. Awake, arise, receive. Prior to our relationship with Jesus Christ, we were dead in our trespasses. The Bible says that spiritually. We were dead in our trespasses. Yeah. But we awoke. God's spirit entered within us, in, in, into our hearts, and the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives within us, and we would also walk in newness of life. We receive the gift of salvation, and now we are light in the Lord as God's children. My prayer is that we as a church would remain awake, because the hour is urgent. I think we can all agree that the hour, the days that we're living in right now, are urgent. Paul pouring his heart out as he's writing to the church in Ephesus. He knew that the days were urgent then, as the days are urgent now. And it's, a lot of similarities can be drawn with this. So back to the story. After we see Buffy Lips, we move to the north side of the building of the Capitol, and there's a worship band that had set up on the stairs of the Capitol. Eight people worshiping. They had, just like what we see here. It was beautiful. They did that for five hours. People were sunburned. Men, women, and children. We saw older men on their knees with their faces on the ground praying on behalf of our nation, praying and interceding on behalf of our children, the unborn, the born, praying on behalf of our leadership. It was unreal. It shook me to the core. I don't have the video to play now, but this went on for five hours. And the sound of worship, just like what happens here, when we worship, right, that, that permeates through the darkness in these neighborhoods, guys. That day, that music permeated through the dark corridors and dark hallways of that Capitol building, and light meant the darkness face on. And that music permeated through the park. Everyone, the CHP guys on horseback heard it. It was beautiful. So that was one of the things that had happened. And I was thinking about this. I, I remember at a moment in time thinking, how did we get here? What happened? How did we get here? To this point in time right now, where we're even having to rally and lobby and be a, a, a representation of, of, against this bill. And I thought about this story that comes to mind. It's a powerful story. It's in the Book of Lamentations. I shared this with Jim a few weeks back. Jeremiah in the Book of Lamentations is weeping over the destruction of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was utterly destroyed. And it was destroyed because of the sin that had continued to be committed by the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom. 
The stones of the temple were thrown and scattered throughout the streets because everything was destroyed by the Babylonian Empire, the Babylonian king. And Jeremiah there, prior to the destruction of this, there's a military officer. He's, he's Nebuchadnezzar's right-hand man, one of, the, one of the top military generals. He sees Jeremiah as he's riding in, probably smiling in his beautiful attire, things on fire, the city just in, in shambles. And he looks at Jeremiah and he says this. He says, Jeremiah, you know why this has happened. Because this people has been disobedient to the Lord their God. Yep. This is coming from a pagan military general. That was incredible. And before that, one more story that takes place. God tells Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 19, to take the leaders, pay attention to that, to take the elders of the nation of Judah and to gather them up and to take them down to a place called the Valley of ben Hinnom. And he tells Jeremiah, he says, Jeremiah, take a clay pot with you. And when you take that clay pot, what you're going to do is you're going to walk with them down to the Valley of ben Hinnom, And you're going to share with them that this same valley the valley where the children, the boys and the girls, were sacrificed to the pagan god Baal, those things are remembered. And because this nation will continue to move and continue to stay in this, in this stubborn position of being disobedient to me, you're going to raise that pot above your head and throw it at the ground. And the shattering, the brokenness, the broken state of that pot is a direct representation of what's to come to the people of the nation of Judah, and also what's to come of the nation itself. Jeremiah fast forward to Lamentations, weeping over the destroyed city, thinking, how did we get here? He knew full well how that transpired. We'll continue on to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17, as we get ready to close here. And this reads, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord here is. Paul reminded the church of how important it is that we remain vigilant in our walk as Christ followers. And the will of the Lord is that we would ultimately glorify him with our lives as we are his hands and feet, as we are his body. I want to read a scripture. It's not in your, in your notes, but I want to read this out loud. This is Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. And it reads, You are the light of the world. A town built on the hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and they give light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Guys, as it gets darker, we shine brighter. We have the ability to shine brighter. So it's important that we think about the significance of what Jesus said over 2,000 years ago and how it applies to us today as the church. Getting ready to close that day at the Capitol, at 4 p.m., they voted on the bill, or they're getting ready to vote on the bill. A pastor testifies with a, with a physician, and the pastor looks at that committee in the eyes, and he says, I just want you to know this, that you are fully and completely accountable to God based upon the decisions that are made wow. here today. Wow. Life is sacred in the eyes of God. He was saying this to 12 people. Imagine, you know when you see that scene and they're up, they're popped up high, and you're looking up at them, and they, they're in positions of prestige, positions of power, you know. But he said that, he said that to them. And then this is the, one of the most beautiful things. Hundreds of people came in single file, and they said, hi, my name is Joey. I'm from Riverside or San Bernardino, California. I plead that you vote no on AB 2223. Parents were lifting up their children. Mike, imagine lifting up Jace. And Jace says, hi, I'm Jace. Vote no on this bill. Parents were bringing their grandbabies up. It was unreal. The bill still passed, and it's moving to the Senate now. But driving home that day, I looked at Dominic, and I said, now I feel like we lost the battle. We're driving away from the battlefield now. And I had tears in my eyes as we're going back through that grapevine area. And he says, Garrett, God knows why we showed up. He says, God knows why the church showed up. And those people in those big fancy chairs, he says, those people know why we showed up. And I'll never forget that, but I think about what it means for us as the church to show up. There was a house built yesterday, and it was given to a man named uh, Diego, and he was homeless. He and his wife were homeless, recovering from substance abuse, and they're sober now, praise God. 
and their three little babies, they get the keys to their, they get the keys to their home yesterday. And you think about